So I'm going to give you my, my startup journey and my story about what, what I've done and my experience. And I am a dyed-in-the-wool technologist. I have invented a lot of technologies in a lot of different areas. And what I'm going to do in this talk is I'm going to have two parts of the talk. The first part of the talk, I'm going to talk about the company, what we did. Essentially, I'm going to give you like a little mini pitch um, about what the company is. And then the second half, I'm going to tell you about what I learned doing this. And these, tech, these lessons are really specific to technologists, to uh, you know, what technologists see, how we view the world, and how that impacts how we create something and how we you know, create a company. So these opinions are mine. They don't represent any company I will have or ever work for, but they're, they're, they're what I've learned. And I'm sh gonna share some lessons with you that I think are kind of harsh lessons, maybe difficult lessons to hear. And the reason I'm sharing them with you is because I actually want more women doing startups. I want more women to, so I want to give you these harsh lessons so you like, be prepared. This is what it is and kind of know when you're getting into it. And I don't, I don't think I, I knew when I started what I was doing. So our thesis at Coco is that color affects a huge number of things that people buy. And you have to pick a color of paint. You have to pick a product. It's actually really hard. And people can go to a specific product category. They show up, they have money, they want to buy and they look at the color choice. They're like, oh, kill me now. This is just too hard. So they just like leave. And this problem was bad in store when you walked in and you didn't know what to do. Now it's even worse online because displays lie. They don't tell you what the true color is. The displays are uncalibrated. And when that color was captured, it was captured by an imaging device that have maybe different color sensitivities. So when you look at something online, you don't know what it is. And my background is in color imaging. I manage the color research group at HP. Before that, I was, believe it or not, was in video conferencing and networking. But I actually ran a whole research project on how to create high fidelity color and recognize high fidelity color. And it's actually way more complicated than I ever knew before I started. So that's my core capability. So we're going to apply this core capability. I showed you those other product categories. Actually, it's a trillion dollars of commerce that occurs where color is an important factor in the decision of the product that you buy. The first category that we're going to hit is cosmetics. Because cosmetics is a very intense color choice category. And cosmetics is a $150 billion worldwide industry. It's $32 billion in the United States. And this is a hard problem to solve. And part of why it's hard to solve is that retailers, this is a mass retailer stocks, 20,000 color SKUs. Which means it's not only challenging for the consumer to buy the product, it's darn hard for them to have service personnel that actually know what's going to be good for you. So this is actually a really complicated business problem for them. And the other thing about this product category that most people don't realize is that this is the highest margin product category that most retailers sell. If it wasn't for beauty, retailers like Macy's would have a much tougher bottom line than they're actually having. And for a lot of mass retailers, beauty is their number one profit category and number one in revenue for that store. So it's actually a very important category. So they're motivated to do something about this. And that in-store process I told you, okay, that's, that looks pretty di difficult and daunting. Online, it's even worse, again, because you don't know the color of the display. And we have an explosion of brands going online because you can be a lifestyle and say, hey, I'm going to create this lipstick. I'm going to have a bunch of YouTubers talking about it. I'm going to sell it online. Well, what, when you sell online, you put this up in front of the user. What is that? A bunch of dots. Who knows what the color of those are? That's what you're supposed to pick. And people also understand multicultural requirements. Before, in America, we had white girl makeup. We had black girl makeup. That's not the world. And even then, it wasn't, a, it's not a one color. It's not one color. Now you have the golden middle. You have all these. So you can have, in some lines, 45 colors. How are you going to pick that out? It's really, really tough. And this results in online sales of beauty having the lowest conversion rate due to this color problem. So we thought, bang up opportunity. All these online brands going online have to sell. We have the solution for them. So what we've created here, I'm going to show you our technology. Our first app that we created was, we said, you know what? Women shop on the mobile devices. Let's create an app where you can take your photograph. It'll analyze your skin tone. It'll tell you the products that are perfect for you. We can build that. And the reason we know how to build that is because when I was a technologist, a senior scientist at HP Lab, I invented something called mobile color matching. And mobile color matching is the ability to use a 
printed color standard, which is printed on special media and has a special behavior about it, but allows me to look at this little color chart in any image. We extract it wherever it is in the chart in the image. We analyze all the way that the colors appear in the image post-processing. From that, we can calculate how the image was formed by the camera and what the lighting was and all the different things that affect the actual true color of the values. So we're using this as a control in the system and these are printed for us and we have a special process we go through to assure that they really are the colors that we need them to be for the standard. So we put that all together in an app and we built, this was our first product and I'll just show you how that how that works. You hold the chart, take your photo, and that's all real-time screen capture that was done. And boom, these are all the colors that Melly can wear on all the brands. Something would have taken somebody a lot of time and a lot of hours to run around, swatch it, swab it, open the bottles. They don't let you open the bottles in mass and do all that. And we do that across Prestige and um, uh, mass. Yes. No, that's one brand, and that's her color, Golden Light. And then the next one, It Cosmetics, and that's her color in it. So she's Golden Light and Suntegrity. We, we analyze the skin tone, and we say, for all these lines, they have shades that match your tone, and this is your color, this is your color, this is your color. Yeah. So we thought, we have created the only, the first mobile application that can create color accuracy and tell you what to wear. You can do this at home, clean face, you don't have to have makeup on, and there's nobody shaming you at the counter. What is not to love? Like, this is, sounds great, and investors like this too because we have substantial intellectual property. We know how to take an image and color calibrate. That's an image that's uncalibrated calibrated because we've remapped it after we know what the true colors are. Then we take that image and we say, okay, is my clicking not working? There we go. Um, then we take the colors and we process that image. We use a specially created face detector. We process all the pixels. And to our data scientists, a woman is nothing more than a three-dimensional color distribution. They're sad to find out that's all she is. We analyze her color distribution and we compare women who are using our app in real time to hundreds of women that we've physically met in person, imaged up their skin, a makeup artist, two of them have always tried every product on different skins. So we actually have the largest database of human skin tones and which cosmetic actually works on that skin tone after application, oxidation, interaction with the skin, all that kind of stuff. We built that all into a data model. So that's, that, that's our data is based on real makeup artists who swatch the product because the product in the bottle or a photo of a product is not the actual color. We have to actually physically see it. So what I've painted for you is an interesting technology an expanding market with a clear problem need that we think is, is important. And we have growth in that market and we have a really high margin product that you think the retailers would be very, very focused on solving. So up till now, that's all about Coco and that's what we've done. So I assembled a group of technologists. We built our first application. We, we thought, okay, this is great. We're, we're in good shape. Now I'm gonna go into the lessons of this. So. The lessons from the journey for me are, you know, things I learned trying to do, trying to solve this problem, trying to solve the problem. And this, it turns out the problem I'm trying to solve that I haven't solved yet is what is our business exactly, right? I'm a technologist who follows, I'm really a technologist who loves to solve problems and I really use the user as my guiding principle. So she can't buy, let's help her. The retailer can't sell, let's, fig let's figure out how to help that retailer. But what I hadn't really figured out is exactly who's gonna pay for this. And how? So in that, you know, great market opportunity, but what I haven't connected is the dots between who's going to pay for this and how they're going to pay for it and how we're going to sell it to them. So that was, that's, that was our big problem. And that's, you can see that in the slides I show you. Like I never really covered the business model. I covered the technology, I covered the opportunity, but I didn't cover the business model. And that was actually our big challenge that we had to figure out. And so as a technologist, oh my God, you know, like, create something where you got a whole new business model in, in addition to a whole new technology. That was two levels of complexity I didn't realize I was taking on. So let me talk about that. But I think, okay, I'm in Silicon Valley. I can raise money to figure out that. Like, I, we got technology nobody else has. People think it's cool. I'll go raise money. I read every day in TechCrunch. You just go out there and you raise money. Turns out, no, no. 
When you read these articles in TechCrunch and how somebody sauntered into a VC's office in their hoodie and they asked for money and they got $5 million before they walked out, typically a young guy, like that's what you read and you think, well, my idea is good. Of course you think your idea is good. You just quit your job to do the idea, right? You're pretty vested in it. But is it really a great idea? How do you know? And so how do you know it's a great idea is you've gotten some validation. But the truth is when you read those articles in TechCrunch, and I swear it's a misinformation service, it makes it, it's fun entertainment to read about these stories, but the truth is that $5 million that somebody got, it was from a VC who had already funded them before on their other venture, or somebody who came from that space, and the VC raised money because they said they were gonna deploy capital into a particular segment, and this person was from that segment. And that's the boring stuff you don't read about, it's not talked about, but really, there's always a backstory. So dig for the backstory, you'll find logic there between why things happen, and it's not something they write about. So you have to really look for this. So that's my first lesson is that whenever you see something in the press, there is a backstory. Go do your due diligence. There's more to it than they ever tell you. And then the other misinformation we have is like, feces are sitting around and they're just looking for a great idea and they want to put money in our great idea. That's what they want to do. And it turns out feces don't want to fund technology. They want to fund businesses. Right? So what you're pitching to them is a new business. If they could put money into a business and have a five-year return of 10x, 100x their money, and they didn't have to build technology, they wouldn't. They don't actually care. <laughs> technology to, the, to them means a differentiated product. It means an ability to protect their investment. So when a technology is hard, all they hear is, good, I can protect my investment. It doesn't, like, technologists hear and they go, you too believe in the truth and beauty of technology, <laughs> right? You know, we have like a religious fervor about it. They don't, they don't. They actually just wanna make money. So that's okay, you just need to understand that's what they're about. They're not actually about creating new technology. On the way to creating a valuable business, that's what they do. And realize that they go raise money to invest into companies by making promises of return. They don't tell their partners that are investing in them, give us money and we'll change the world and it'll be a better place. Now, a social good investor could, but most of the time they're saying, you give me money, I'll give you 50X back in 10 years. That's the deal that they're making. So they are using you as a vehicle to create that value. So as a startup, you are a vehicle. You're a monetary vehicle. And to think of yourself as being anything more is to romanticize your relationship with venture capital. So ladies, don't romanticize this relationship. <laughs> it is not romantic at all. So the other lesson I have, and that I alluded to about finding the business model, is find your way to revenue as soon as you can. And the reason for that is that revenue solves so many problems. When you walk up to a VC and say, I have an interesting idea, they're like, okay, it's an interesting idea, is the market worth doing? Can you build a product around the idea? Because, right, we had technology, then we had to actually create a product which has a whole user experience with it, and then it has to get deployed. And if you say you've got revenue, it proves you had a technology that worked, you have a product in the market, you were able to find a customer, because let me tell you, if you're a startup, compared to like being from a large enterprise, finding that customer and getting them to engage with you is really, really hard. And as technologists, we do not appreciate the level of work that it takes to get a customer to talk to you and for them to use a new technology, the first question is, well, who else is using it? Right, well, nobody, because you're new, it's new. Well, they don't like that, they don't wanna be. There's comfort in, in, in other people using it. So finding your first revenue is a way of solving all those problems. And if you go to pitch for money and you've already got revenue, it's a much easier conversation because you know how you're gonna get the revenue, you know how they're paying you, you've already, been able to articulate a value to a customer. So my only guiding advice is figure out how you're gonna to get to revenue and get there as fast as you can. And that means you've gotta really follow the revenue. So corollary, if you're a technologist who wants to, whose passion is about following the technology and that's your, you wake up happy every morning doing that, don't do a startup as a CEO, just don't. Because you have to follow revenue, you have to follow business opportunity, you cannot follow the technology, sad.
but that's that's how winners and losers in business are applied. They're not for the best technology. They're like, did you get there? Did you crack the business problem? And were you able to execute? So that's one important thing that technologists don't have to get as a leap of, of understanding for them. The last one is, well, the second to last one is customer discovery is hard. So as an early stage company, like who is going to buy your product, right? And all these names here, these are all companies we talked to, we worked with, we have, you know, engineered our way into having a conversation. It sometimes took weeks and weeks and weeks and months. They're all different. They're little teeny indie brands, only e-commerce, never heard of some of these, to really big mass, prestige, specialty retail. They're all in the beauty business. They're all people we felt could value and benefit our technology. And to get to those conversations and meet the right people and to have that conversation is really, it's a huge process. It is an incredible process. And you think, I got a technology. I solved all these world-class problems. Like, this should count for something. No, there's this whole other problem, which is called cracking the market. And that's, that's actually what a lot of the startup time is spent on that. So customer discovery is the key skill. And customer discovery, when you talk with them, it will modify your product. It will modify what you think you're making because they have different requirements and different needs. So before that, we're appreciating the problem from one perspective, but we are not a retailer. We don't understand what they care about, how they deploy solutions. There's some things that we're doing in a deployment now. I can't talk about it publicly, but one of those companies on there, a large one, is doing a big deployment with us, and we're solving their beauty, the beauty color purchase problems. The things that were so exciting for them in the product weren't, were th really? You, that's, that's a big deal? And they're like, oh my God, that's even like, that's trivial to do. Don't tell them. But it's trivial to do. We can do that. Other things that we thought, we're actually solving the color matching a different way. We're actually using a different technology than, than the photograph, but we're solving another way. And, and we had to solve it a different way because of their use model they were in. And so we changed what we did. We actually took that feedback and we changed what we're doing. And a different customer, they want a different set of features and capabilities. So this was actually very hard, but it was a really important learning for us because we are building something to delight them. And we are using ourselves as a proxy for that conversation at the beginning, but you have to move beyond the proxy and really talk to them directly. And it's not easy unless you have a founding team member who comes from that industry. And we were a group of technologists starting this company. So you'll get feedback from customers you get feedback from people you're pitching for money. You get feedback from and people who want to give you advice. I probably have on the order of 15 advisors I work with from different areas. They all give you advice. So you can get such a blazing headache from listening to people. Like they said, they do this. They said, do this. And so I would say, look for the patterns of the advice. Have enough distance to say, okay, like four people have said this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this seriously. Uh, but one person, don't just do what they say because that. See if there's if there's good reasons why they say it, and see if you have it repeated um, by multiple people. And then one thing I'm going to tell you about finding patterns in advice, feedback that's very important to women, and it's a specific. Everything I've said so far is just anybody could take this fact. This is a piece of advice just for women. There's a lot of stuff written about women only get three percent of venture money. Venture capitalists don't take women seriously. Uh, you know, a lot of the stuff about startup and women having a, a, a bad spot to start with. So I would agree that that is the environment. I would, however, say that what the downside of that belief system is that I, I've, I'm in a group of women CEOs who started companies. And the one downside I've seen in some women, is that when somebody gives them negative information, they want to say, he's just a guy, he just doesn't like women CEOs, and he's just blowing smoke, like I don't believe him. So the danger is that you discount sometimes people's feedback because you think they just don't want, like they're just against women and they're just saying dumb things. And it, it lets you lose feedback that's valuable. So the way to look at, like if you get to pitch with somebody, now, there are just jerks out there, and this person's just being a jerk or harassing you. They're just, they just are, put them in the junk pile. That's just junk. But if they're not, you are getting somebody's brains who's seen way more business models than you. Like, I've done one startup. I've done 20. If they funded 20 startups, they have a lot more information about how startups behave. 
they're putting their brains, if it's a 10 minute pitch, a 20 minute pitch in one hour, they're giving you their brains for that much time. What is the obvious problem that they see? They're always going to give you problems. That's their job. Is either you're communicating that poorly or you actually do have a problem and maybe they have a suggestion for someone you should talk to who might know something about that. So, so take a no as being, you know, is there somebody you know has a similar, you know, similar thing that's a, that's a problem that they might have some advice about. And so every advice, feedback, you have to cull it, you have to triage it, but it's really a gift. And as the CEO of a startup, you have a lot of stuff coming at you, and it's actually a gift, so you need to be able to go through that and figure out how you can solve that. So I, I for example, had one venture group I was pitching, and they do much later series funding than, than the stage I'm at. And, but they said, you know what? There's two CEOs we know who had a very similar business problem. Why don't I arrange a call for you to talk to those CEOs? And, you know, they, they can tell you about their experience. And that was so helpful because another CEO to, to another one, they're incredibly open because they know how miserable it is to try to figure this stuff out and how tough and how much energy and time you spend on it. So that was great because I wouldn't have known these guys. And, and he opened the door because he'd funded them to say, hey, you know, I like what she's doing. Talk to her. So not every no is a, is a go away. A no can be not now. You know, there's a lot of subtlety to this. That's all I'm saying. And don't discount it because, you know, they don't fund women. Just, just like take it as advice. And don't discount. The other corollary to that is don't discount greed. Greed is a beautiful unifier. It really is. Because if that investor sees that they can make money from what you're doing, they really, you know, they don't care so much. Where it matters more is when there's very little evidence of success, then they're going to go, with, like, I kind of like this guy. It reminds me of me when I was 19 and obnoxious, right? It's going to be a certain kind of comfort, right? Because, they, like, we could, we could hang out together. But the more evidence you have, the more it becomes just a really great opportunity. So greed is your friend. It's a unifier. If they think they can make money investing in you, they're more, they're much more likely to, regardless of, you know, how they feel about, you know, would they want to have, you know, would they want to play golf with you or not? So that's my feedback on, you know, really looking at, at what you can learn from feedback from other people. Okay. And then my conclusions are, you start with a great idea. That's when it's exciting. Every, the world is full of promise. And then the mechanics of actually building a business are very complicated. What you actually have to do, what people actually want to pay you for, may be different than what you think they should be paying you for. And that's the hard work of the startup, is to find that repeatable business model and be able to create something that has the opportunity for high value growth. And then you've got a limited time to do it. You only have so much money that you've raised. You only have so much energy, lifespan, capability of the team to keep going on this. And so you're running a clock the whole time. So you have to be very time efficient with what you do and also just realize there's only so long before people are just, they're exhausted. They can't, they can't do this anymore. And that actually is what kills startups. You just get too tired. You just can't do it anymore. So anyway, I'll take questions now. Does any, I'm happy to take questions if anybody likes them. Yeah. Um, I'm just reflecting your slides in my mind. You talked about um, one of the problems that, one of the challenges that we should address where we should find a path to revenue. Yeah. Um, could you speak a little bit about that for your personal journey? It's the reflection. Yeah. The challenge. Yeah. So I thought like the hard thing is building technology and by, by halfway through this, more, a little less than halfway through, I realized like salespeople are gods. <laughs> like I worship salespeople at this point. I, I really do. And I have to say like, if you don't have great salespeople, you got nothing. And if you're a little company and you don't have a salesperson, guess who do th does that job? <laughs> Every job that doesn't get done by somebody, it's the CEO's job. You do all the jobs. Like, if there's nobody there who can do that, guess what? You get to do that job. So um, I had to kind of learn to do that and I had to learn the mechanics of it. But it's, it's a really, it's a skill. It's a skill. And in certain industries, like retail is an old industry. And it's an enterprise, which means that they're long-lived relationships. So one of the things I did, and I didn't, I glossed over that, 
is to solve that business model, we actually went through five accelerator incubators. Five. And one of them was Techstars, and we did the retail incubator. And that's where I got a whole bunch. And I went specifically to do that one because they had retail advisors and mentors for me, right? Who could open the doors, who knew the CEOs of some of the largest retailers and were, were very close to them. So I had to get into the retail ecosystem. Now, so if I was going to start a company again, I would start with somebody who was my founding partner, who was salesperson in the industry I wanted to sell to. Because they can quickly take what you're thinking about and go and say, hey, what do you think of this? Would you, would, you, know, would you be interested in this? So that customer discovery can start before you actually build a product. Um, but we were technologists, so we started with technology. Um, I think that starting with sales and having a very strong sales support, that that's something that I did not fully appreciate, and I appreciate it every day now. <laughs> I learned that lesson. <laughs> Is that application available, um, Well, so if you want, you can contact me, and I'll give you a color chart. You could try the Coco Beauty app that's in the App Store, but we're actually not really. That's sort of a, our test vehicle, but if you want to get it, I'll give you a chart and you can use it. But it's not something we're, we're promoting right now. We're actually more of a B2B company. That app was in there for consumer testing and for feedback and stuff, but we're not actively uh, marketing it to consumers directly. I will give you a chart. And I'll give it to you. Yes, yes. It'll be, yeah, it'll come through one of our B2B partners. Yeah, yeah, it will. It will come through that way. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. All right. Sure. Right. So um, we have we took an angel money, and angel money. To, uh, there's professional angels, and then angels that you know. And so I had so the first money, the first check that we got in was from somebody who was a colleague of mine when I was at HP. And he said, I want to write you a check. So the first checks were kind of foisted on us. We're like, I love what you're doing. I believe in you. And those checks are largely because they like and they have a relationship with the CEO. They're, they're really a personal investment that they make. Now, this guy actually does do an angel investing. So we have a whole group of people who says, I want to support you, and I'm going to write you checks. So the first, the first dollars you get in come from that nearby circle where you've got no evidence and no proof. Then the next set can be professional angels who look at investing. Now the thing to remember about angels is they don't have to deploy capital. They're not like a venture firm. Like they don't have this fund that they have to deploy. So they're kind of looking for things they'd like to do. And call those, they're like mini hobbyists. And those people require you to socially network to them, to find them and their individuals. And then there's angels who invest in specific segments. So I know a lot of angel investors now, but I know for each one of them what segment they're looking to invest in. So they're very, there's like a whole zoology of investors. Like, <laughs> this guy likes kangaroos. This guy's only interested in zebras, right? And so you meet them. And then there's professional angel groups, but they tend to be kind of social circles. So venture, there's a lot written about venture. Corporate is hard. There's a lot to that because I'm out of time, but it's, Strategics can want you to only work with them, not work with anybody else. So you have to be very careful because nobody else, sometimes nobody else will invest with you if you take a strategic because then they want to just have the company basically be acquired. And then that limits the upside for the other investors. So um, ventures there, but I say both accelerators and ventures require so much evidence before you get accepted. Like some of these accelerators you see, they actually want you to have revenue before you come in. Like you're way past an idea. You're past idea, team, technology, product, revenue. Oh, let's incubate you now. What? <laughs> no, that's, that's how it is now. So you have to do all that kind of on your own. So your early money is your, your angels. Yeah. Thanks very much.